good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Adam said, I'm Amelie Roper, and I'm the Research Development Manager here at the British Library. My role involves bidding for research funding and setting up collaborative research projects. And I also had the privilege of being involved with the judging process for the Research Award. So, the BL Labs Research Award recognises outstanding and innovative work that has been carried out using the British Library's digital collections and data. In this category, we are particularly looking for projects or activities which show the development of new knowledge, research, methods or tools. We had a very diverse range of entries this year from all kinds of uh, different institutions, researchers at different levels of their careers, independent researchers, and today we're just going to highlight eight of these. So, for the first uh, project, um, I'd like to talk about doctoral theses as alternative forms of knowledge. This entry came from Professor Catherine Montgomery and a team of PhD students at the University of Bath. The research makes use of the British Library's online thesis service, Ethos. Um, hopefully you're familiar with Ethos, but basically for those who aren't, it's a database of over half a million uh, doctoral theses um, produced in the UK. And this project used Ethos data um, to search for references in theses to internationalisation and to look for the production of southern knowledge, which they defined as knowledge generated in the colonial encounter. Next up, we have the history of Refley Spring in Gaywalt near Kings Lynn. So this came from an independent researcher and local historian, Andrew Clapham, who used the British Library's online British newspaper archive to research the local history of Refley Spring. And he looked at it in the eyes of those reporting on it at the time, so using the, the newspapers um, from different er eras. The database covers the 17th century onwards. As well as producing pamphlets which are for sale at the local museum, he's constructed a website um, to show the findings of his research, which... Uh, draws heavily on the British newspaper archive. And I do encourage you to follow the, the link on the screen and have a look at that. So next up, we have the missing film reels of Tamil cinema. This was produced by an independent filmmaker and researcher, Sugith Krishramurthy, who produced a 100-minute documentary film which draws in part on information gleaned from Cacti magazine Cacti magazine was digitised as part of the British Library's Endangered Archives programme. The film interrogates the purposes and responsibilities of film archives in the digital age and argues the case for making out-of-copyright films available. And if you're inspired and would like to have a look at that film, um, you can use the link on the slide. And turning now to the Delius catalogue of works, this was a collaborative project with Joanna Bullivant, Daniel Grimley, David Lewis and Kevin Page, who are a team based at the University of Oxford, together with the British Library, the Delius Trust and the Royal Library in Denmark. They have created a comprehensive the thematic catalogue of works by the composer Frederick Delius. We have many of Delius' sources in the library here. Their research is integrated with the British Library's archives and manuscripts catalogue and make u makes use of some specialist software, Mermaid, created by the Royal Danish Library. The core catalogue data is stored as MEI, an XML-based standard for the encoding and markup of musical data inspired by TEI for text. And you can search the catalogue um, at the link on the slide. And now we have the making of Samuel, Samuel Beckett's On Entendant Goto, Dirk van Hool, Pim Verhulst and Vincent Nate from the Centre for Manuscript Gen Genetics at the University of Antwerp have conducted extensive research to analyse the genetic and publication history of this work. They've used high-resolution facsimiles and digital copies of Beckett's works held at the British Library and other archives around the world bringing together the manuscript sources digitally. 
This entry is for, is for, is for a project called Sampler API. This is a free API produced by Martin Harris, Dal Shang and Mark Levine, who are based at Birkbeck, University of London. The API semantically labels documents with named entities and sentiments using a conditional random field modelling approach, which takes account of text surrounding a word and machine learning. It was trained on the British Library's digitised Financial Times newspaper archives. And if you'd like to see more of that, uh, visit the link sampler.com. And now to Netley Abbey Matters. This is a website dedicated to the history of the village of Netley, which is just southeast of Southampton. It was produced by a local <coughs> historian and independent researcher, Brenda Findlay. The majority of her research draws on newspaper archives which have been digitised at the British Library. Brenda also undertakes local family history research relating to Netley, and um, I think she does this free of charge, but she asks for donations which she gives to the Alzheimer's Society, so a very worthy cause. And last, but by no means least, we have her stories, sites of suffragette protest and sabotage. This was created by a team at the University of Lincoln and Historic England. Krista Kalman, Rachel Williams, Tamsin Sylvie, Ben Elwood and Rosie Ryder. Their website showcases the results of a large research project to identify buildings that were significant in the suffrage movement. A component of their research used searches within the digitised British newspaper archive. And if you have a look at the links, um, you'll be able to see more about what they did. OK, so this year we had a lot of entries um, in the research category. As I said, we were thrilled by the diversity of the entries and also the different types of research. Uh, people at all stages of careers and um, from lots and lots of different backgrounds. So we'd like to make two honourable mentions before uh, announcing the winner and I'm going to ask both of these honourable mentions to come up to the stage to receive their award and then to talk very briefly about their project. So these honourable, me honourable mentions were considered to have made valuable contributions to scholarship in their respective areas of research and the first of these is doctoral thesis and an alter as alternative forms of knowledge. So if you'd like to come up to the stage... Well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to, to, to have this award, partly because the British Library is one of my favourite places ever in the world. Um, but um, in, inside the British Library, um, uh, as has been mentioned, um, there is a, a digital repository that holds all of the, the doctoral theses that have been completed um, by British universities. Um, anyone in this room who's done a doctorate or knows anyone who's done a doctorate knows what a huge amount of work this is. Um, so what my question around this really was, why do we not construct this digital repository as a source of knowledge? Um, and individual doctoral theses might be consulted um, by supervisors or by other people who are doing doctorates, but um, I think it's fair to say that the ethos repository is an underused um, resource. Um, so my, the research that I did, along with some um, some doctoral students who were helping me, was to try to mine this resource. And although I looked at internationalisation, um, and that was a very specific um, area of um, higher education research, anybody could look at this, this, this repository and search it because it's open access and it's searchable. So, so what I did was I searched p particularly for, for internationalisation of higher education and analysed those theses. Um, and, um, and, and, and downloaded them into an NVivo package um, and then did an analysis of them. So what I found was, um, what was really interesting was that um, the, the, looking at those doctoral theses allowed me to construct a sort of geography of, of doctorates. Where were the doctorates done? What were they studying? And, and, and what, what kinds of theory were they using? Um, one of the interesting things that I found that, that a lot of international students come to the UK to do doctoral theses, and a lot of these doctoral theses were um, researching their own, their own country contexts. Interestingly, often they were using only Western theory to, um, to do this. Um, 
But in small numbers of the doctorates, um, I found that there, that there were a lot of alternative perspectives that could bring very new um, approaches and new ideas to, to my field. Um, so, so basically, um, I, 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 I want to do some more work on this. Um, and there are these sorts of digital repositories in other countries, in Canada, Australia, in China, large numbers of them. And I think my next step will be to look comparatively. But um, just also just to recommend that digital repository as, as, as a, a huge source of knowledge and a body of knowledge that we should consult more often. Thank you very much for this award. Congratulations again to Catherine and her team at the University of Bath. And now on to our second honourable mention, which goes to her stories, Sites of Suffragette Protest and Sabotage. So again, if you'd like to come up to the stage. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's absolutely thrilling to have to have won this to have won anything <laughs> but particularly to have won this I'm Krista Cameron from University of Lincoln and this is Tamsin from Historic England the suffrage centenary that we're celebrating this year is very much not just about events it's also about places and this is what our project was looking at so the project specifically uncovered the militant suffragette connections of a number of England's historic buildings. The sites that we looked at were representative of places which had hosted activities which ranged from the very, very mundane, such as the Wellington Column in Liverpool, which saw regular suffragette meetings and newspaper sales weekly from about 1906 right through to 1914, to the more spectacular, but in many ways less obvious, such as the pillar box, which you can see on the slide behind you, which is in in Highbury and was actually set on fire by suffragettes as part of their arson campaign in February 1913. It was a very, very short-term project, time to fit in with the centenary. I, I started the work literally on Boxing Day, and this is how quickly things move in digitisation. I started it in the pre-digital era, going through old microfilm copies of the Suffragette Press. And then luckily, as the project moved on, the British Library digitised all of the Suffragette newspapers as part of the centenary project which really 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 speeded things up and meant that I had a lot more time to get on to what I'd always intended to be the digitized part of the project which was looking at local newspapers to back up the sites that we discovered. And then um, this research um, allowed Historic England to um, uh, to identify 41 places which are available on an interactive map so the public can explore these and um, we were able to officially recognize this history um, on our in our list so upgrading and relisting um, places so it was a really important part of um, historic England's um, centenary activities that allow people to celebrate the heritage of um, of places in, in their areas that um, witness the the um, struggle for suffrage so Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so congratulations to the University of Lincoln and Historic England. And now um, I'm just going to announce the winner. I'm going to, to tantalise you a little. I'm going to tell you the four things that we really liked about this project, um, and that may give you some clues as to, to who's actually won. So firstly, um, this project faced a really steep challenge in that it was trying to serve a variety of audiences, scholarly audiences, performers, different types of people, and make, make their content accessible to a variety of users. And they produced something that did this, does this in a very po polished way. The other thing that we really liked about this entry was that they'd worked with a really wide range of partners, different types of partners, academic partners, a charitable trust, and another library as well. Thirdly, and this will prob probably give it away, um, the fact that it is integrated with the British Library's own um, archives and manuscripts catalogue really um, adds an extra dimension and longevity to this resource. And fourthly, the fact that it's extensible so the resource itself can be extended to include more information, but it can, could also be applicable to other um, sources as well. So without further ado, the winner is the Delius Catalogue of Works. 
Well, thank you so much, Amelie, and we're the BL Labs project because we're really honoured to have received this award. Um, and as Amelie said, it's been a collaboration of lots and lots of different partners. So the Oxford University, the Royal Library of Denmark, the Delius Trust, who've been on board from the start and extremely patient as well, and um, the Arts and Humanities Research Council who funded it. Um, and in addition to that, the team, the music team at the BL, Richard Chesser, Amelie, when she was working there, and the other members of staff there were an invaluable support throughout, because a lot of this involved actually getting in there and looking at the physical manuscripts and then making the connection between the old manuscripts and the new technologies. So, um, as you said, this research award was all about data sets and BL collections and doing digital things with them. So, I thought I'd start with our data set. So I'll come back to this, but um, our main data set was the um, substantial collection of Delius manuscripts. The um, BL has nearly all of his stuff, and so it was a nice sort of coherent collection to be working with. And this, the, um, the, manuscript catalog of the Delia stuff is amazing, but it's also, you wouldn't necessarily know it's there if you're a Delius enthusiast, someone who was interested in performing something by Delius or a student, and then you have to actually understand what you're looking for when you get in there because it is a record of manuscripts rather than works. So you will find a manuscript called with a, a snazzy title like 1745-2-9, and then you have to go in there and you'll find that there are two pages related to the particular song you're interested in, so in looking at, but there's also things in five other manuscripts as well. How do those things relate to each other? How do they contribute to the story of a particular work and translate into helpful practical information? There are also other um, data sets we had to work with, which is four separate printed sources regarding Delius's works. So in some cases, these are of manuscripts. Some, one is the collected edition and one is the um, a actual works catalog. But as you can see from this example, you need to have two separate volumes out at once because one's like an updating of this first one and you need to be able to read um, sort of chatty notes in order to get where he's going with this. So what we wanted to do was create something that would be suitable for a wide variety of people and to make sense of all this data to be able to help people to understand works. So, and what we came up with was enabled by the software that we used, the Mermaid software that Amelie mentioned before, um, was something that is hierarchy and narrative. And I'll show you an example of this in a minute. So, um, First of all, we wanted to say, here is the um, fans, if anyone's a cataloger, and you'll recognize the influence of Ferber in this, but we say there's something called a work like Delius's Piano Concerto, and then there, that might exist in several versions. So we wanted to show that hierarchy of how one version relates to the whole and how they relate to each other, but we also wanted to tell a story about that work and how you can rediscover it. Where's it been performed? Where does it exist in manuscripts and published information and so on? So you'll see here's the catalogue proper. So you can see all of the works in the list with their new catalogue number and they're ordered by genre of music and also by within that they're chronological. Um, so starting with the operas, going over to song um, at the end. And you can search for various things. So if you wanted to know what pieces have bells in them, you can get a little list. That's quite exciting. Or you can browse if you wanted to look at all the concertos, say. And so I'll just show you the piano concerto, and then David might want to say a few things. Um, and so this is almost the idea we came up with. So this is searchable, browsable. It's related to works as people would understand them. Um, and also, if you're using any funny references, you can see what they mean, any shorthand. And 
it's also thematic, so you've got that visual connection to the actual music. But with this one, we're telling that story. We're saying this is a work with a complex history, and we need to be able to tell that. Here are sources common to the work, and then you have your original version, and you can see how long it lasts, what the forces are, but you can also see that that wasn't performed. And there's where you'd go to look at the manuscript, and you could click through to the exact manuscript record there if you want to go and look at the physical item. Then it was in a three-movement version, and that was performed. Uh, but, and it was also published, but only posthumously. And then the final version, the one that is most well-known, we can see that that was also performed, and then you can see even there, you can see the, ta the ongoing process of editing, the process of improvement, and all the sources that we have. So this is our best attempt um, at solving some of the problems that the data we had presented and making it useful and presentable for a variety of people. I think David wants to say a little bit about the uh, technical things. Yeah, so. I, I guess it's just a few things also drawing from the, from the keynote this morning that... Um, this is built on software that was released as open source by the um, Royal Library of Denmark. Um, it's built on encodings using an open community-led standard called Music Encoding Initiative, MEI. Um, what that means is that we can use it to generate the website, support the search, and so on, but that also other people who want to use that catalog data can use it in any way they want. Um, it also the music part of the Music Encoding Initiative is not just about catalogue information, but about encoding notation, which means that one could take this catalogue and actually add encoded full scores bit by bit that would then support um, searching by tune, for instance, and so on. So this is a very extensible uh, base on which one can build effectively anything up to a complete edition of works. Um, I think that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>